Well, greetings, Imagination Connoisseurs. Once again, it's I, your Duke of Dope Discourse, your master of fun and wonder, your viceroy of verisimilitude, and, as John Campia once called me, your existential Mr. Rogers. That's right, Robert Meyer Burnett. And this is a mailbag for Wednesday, August 3rd, 2020. As you all know, during the John Campia Show, live every weekday, we take your questions via Super Chats, but we only leave those chats open for, like, seconds and we answer them live on the show. But if you have any questions, any other time, day or night, seven days a week, we've got operatives around the world. Just go to that link and you can send us any comment, any question, any review, whatever you want to send us. And we'll read it here on the mailbag. And to that end, let's see what you have to say. Luke1234 says, tech question. Is there any value in upgrading from a webcam, an Elgato face cam, I have two of those, to an SLR Sony ZV-E10 if the background being used is a green screen? Could you still get a shallow depth of field with a green screen? Well, going to a DSLR, there's there's advantages. Of course, you're going to get a sharper image, but it really depends. What are you going to do with that green screen? Um, obviously, a better image makes the keying a little bit more difficult. You have to have more power, more more magic if you were or if you will um it really depends what are you going to use it for i mean i love the elgato face cam i don't know if i would use it if i was keying a background all the time uh you might want to get a dslr because it gives you a little bit more versatility but if you're just keying in simple backgrounds or i mean if are you le i would assume because you have a green screen background you are keying something back there so probably it would be better than a face cam but in terms of your shallow depth of field, it really depends what you're putting behind yourself. Uh, I don't know. If, do you need depth of field? It really depends. I don't know. It's up to you. I don't know what you're doing with it. But you know what? A DSLR probably would benefit you, but that's a lot more expensive than a face cam, which is, what, 200 bucks. So it really depends on what you're going to do with it, as always. The Canon says... I just pre-ordered the Marvel Premium Format Black Panther Hot Toy. It's expensive, but it might be my last chance to get one with Chadwick's likeness. I already have Killmonger and T'Chaka, but missed out on T'Challa before it was discontinued. Well, okay, first of all, pr Premium Format's a quarter-scale figure. I would assume, since you have T'Chaka and Killmonger, you are getting the Hot Toy because you say Hot Toy. Now, here's the thing. There's, there's two different uh, Hot Toys. I have the Black Panther movie Hot Toy, which is awesome. It has a great face sculpt, and it also comes with kind of like this, I don't know, a, a black light uh, stand that lights up, and he's got the black light uh, a, a sort of accents on his costume. It's awesome. Worth every penny. Uh, I think you're going to be happy with it. Yeah, it's, it's, it's an expensive figure, but like, you know, I wasn't even going to buy the Killmonger unless it had a Michael B. Jordan face sculpt, which they actually... It does. So I think you're going to have a great display. You'll be able to put T'Challa uh, uh, in the middle with that stand, if that's the one you got. That's the version you got, the deluxe. And then have Killmonger and T'Chaka on the each side. But now you got to get a Shuri, bro. you got to get Shuri, and you have to buy the Throne of Wakanda. Then you can have the true. I mean, that would be the chef's kiss set up with all four of those figures. Um, and by all means, send us a photo. I want to see what your display looks like. Garden Variety Vagabond says, just saw an image of New Hope Leia and realized that Millie Bobby Brown actually has a look much like her at that age. Just saying, if they need Leia in a season of Andor, could happen. I mean, you're not the first to point that out. I think you're absolutely right. She does look a lot like Carrie Fisher at that age. I mean, We've been talking a lot about recasting. There's obviously the hashtag recast T'Challa movement. Uh, I could see that. I would not have a problem with Millie Bobby Brown pay, playing Princess Leia. I think that would be a good choice. I don't know if we're going to need to see her in Andor, but, I mean, if we do, that's not a bad way to go. We'll see. We'll see. Garden Variety Vagabond comes back and says, On Rocky, I'm curious if this is a Taylor Swift issue. Taylor Swift tried to buy all rights and was shut out from two sales. She redid all of her albums and told fans to buy these and not the originals. McCartney ended being friends with Michael Jackson for buying the Beatles rights. Well, here's the thing. I don't 
it's not like Taylor Swift. They can't remake the Rocky movies. At least I don't think they would want to remake the Rocky movies. Maybe, you know, it's funny. It never occurred to me. Maybe that's what Sly is talking about. But the simple fact remains, he never owned the rights to Rocky. Or Erwin Winkler and Robert Chartoff did because they produced the original Rocky. And that's, that's, that's the cost of doing business. It ain't show friends. It's show business. And they put up the money. And at the time... Uh, the Rocky franchise didn't exist. It was a crapshoot, even to allow Sylvester Stallone to star in Rocky. And of course, over the years, it obviously led to multiple Rocky sequels and a spinoff franchise, a second spinoff franchise if they make the Drago movie. But I, I, I just don't understand why Sylvester Stallone, who is one savvy businessman, is bitching about them. I don't get it. I don't think it's like Taylor Swift, though. I think that you know, maybe Sly Stallone is tired of not having the money he thinks he's owed. And I can understand that. I mean, it's one thing to make one movie or two movies or even three movies. But there's Rocky Four, Rocky Five, Rocky Six, or Rocky Balboa. Then there's Creed One, Two, and Three. Now Drago. I mean, Rocky is a cottage industry in, unto itself. And it's an industry that's literally built around Sylvester Stallone. But the thing is, he doesn't own it. It ain't show friends, it's show business. And you don't get what you deserve, you get what you negotiated for. And in his case, he gave up his rights to make the movie Rocky. And I would say it was a good bet because if there was no Rocky, there'd be no Rambo. There would be no Expendables. There would be no marrying Cobretti in Cobra. There would be no Oscar, Stop or My Mom Will Shoot, or Victory, or Paradise Alley, or Fist, or even The Samaritan. So I would say, Sly, you made a good deal. Why are you bitching about Rocky now? I mean, you made that movie, it came out in 1976. And now you're bitching in 2022? Life's too short, man. Anyway, I know you're not happy with our opinion of that, but hey, what can we say? Jonathan Namella says, hello, Rob. My favorite super pet was Chip the Squirrel. I love his electric powers. I love Crypto and Ace. I really love all of them. I hope they make Maple Trilogies at least nine movies. I cried a lot. Well, Jonathan, I haven't seen super pets. Uh, John Campia has. I don't know. He didn't say whether he cried or not. I could see him crying in that. I think John's an emotional guy. Uh, maybe he'll one day tell me if he did cry in Super Pets. I don't know if he did. Maybe I'll have to ask Anne. But if you cried in it, Jonathan, I'm, I, I, I feel sure that I will cry too if I ever see it. Jonathan Namella comes back and says, Rob, I remember big movie premieres were held at the TLC Chinese Theater in L.A. Yeah, it's true, including Star Wars. I've been to some. Are there still big movie premieres happening at that famous movie theater? Yes, indeed. How can a fan go to a premiere? Well, the old Hollywood adage, you have to know somebody. Um, you can't just, as a fan, go to a Hollywood premiere. Hollywood premieres are industry events, so usually the people that go beyond those that worked on the actual film and the stars, usually people that work at the studios, press get invited to those premieres, and friends of friends get invited to those premieres, but you can't really, like you can't go buy a ticket to one of those premieres, unfortunately. So you have to know people, and um, hey, you never know. One day, you too might go to a Hollywood premiere with the Chinese. And they're fun. Like a lot of the Marvel movies, they're either at the Dolby Theater, which is part of the same complex, or they're across the street at the El Capitan, or they're at the Chinese. And they're they're fun. I like them. They're fun to go to. Jonathan Namella comes on, and uh, it's Namella, right? If I'm saying your name wrong, phonetically spell it for me next time. I think it's Namella, right? Hello, Rob. I want to tell physical media lovers out there that TMC and AMC have online stores if you're looking for hard-to-find movies from the 20s, the 30s, the 40s, the 50s, the 60s, the 70s, the 80s, and the 90s. What are the, you, you don't like the aughts? Uh, try them out. No, I know, Jonathan, it's easier to get movies from the 90s and the aughts, but I didn't know that. You know, I buy most of my physical media either directly from companies like Kino or Second Sight or Criterion. Actually, I get all my Criterion discs at Barnes & Noble twice a year when they have their 50% off sale. But uh, it's good to know. I did not know that AMC has an online store where they sell movies. I will definitely check that out. I wonder if you can get, as Dieter Bastian would say, a Schnäppchen. That's basically a bargain in German. But uh, thanks, thanks for telling me that, Jonathan. I very much appreciate it. <laughs> Jonathan comes back again. Hello, Rob. Do you think if DC Comics made Batman Beyond animation movies that were successful, they could lead to a live-action Batman Beyond movie? Well, you know. 
that we are, and I'm I'm one of the founding members of the Batman Beyond crew here at the John Campy Show. Now, John probably would disagree, but they have made a Batman Beyond movie, an animated film, which was about the Joker, right, Jonathan? I think. Um, but they did, and I look, I I like Batman Beyond a great deal. I like that series, and I think that they, if they could make a a great Batman Beyond movie, as a matter of fact, I keep forgetting. I'm going to bring my Batman Beyond hot toy in here and just put him on the the table, so I can always point to it. Or maybe I should just bring him in for Friday. I don't know, but I I think the show could be great. A futuristic Batman series with a Batman with future tech. Why not? Bring it on. So I'd love to see it. I'd love to see another uh, Batman Beyond animated movie, too. Why not? Jonathan Namella back again. Uh, hello, Rob. What is it like to see a movie at the famous TLC Chinese Theater? Rob, have you been on a tour there? What is it like outside the famous Chinese Theater with all the famous handprint footprints of past and present celebrities? Well, first of all, what's really interesting um, about the Chinese Theater is obviously it's one of the oldest in L.A. It was built, I, I want to say, in the 19 teens or 20s now i love the chinese theater but i'll tell you something uh i used to have a problem with the sound especially the dialogue in the center channel hard to hear then in 2015 they they reopened the theater after a renovation and they actually excavated down into the ground they dug out the ground and they added a giant imax screen in the chinese theater and they basically doubled they gave it stadium seats, and they doubled the, the, the theater size, really, in terms of, of seats. They added laser projection, full IMAX. I love that theater. That theater rocks. The sound is great. The picture is amazing. And to see a real IMAX movie there, it's unbelievable. And if you ever go sit in a row M or N, those are my favorite places to sit, right in the middle. It's great. I love it. Now, what is it like? I have taken the theater two or more than once. It is a grand old theater. It's very ornate on the inside. The ceilings, uh, incredible. And it's it's like the bathrooms. It's got these big cavernous back bathrooms. You have to walk downstairs to go to the bathroom. It's huge. Um, it definitely belongs to a different era. But they even have a bar inside now. And um, I like it. They have a balcony. They don't usually open the balcony up much. But it's a great theater. I love seeing movies there. I love seeing... Uh, uh, new movies there, especially movies in IMAX. It's my uh, it's my go-to IMAX theater. There are other IMAX theaters in LA, but that theater, oh, I love it. I love it. So, And it's easy to park because it's at the Hollywood and Highland facility. And if you want, you don't even have to park there. You can take the train. It, I know LA has a subway, and it stops at that complex. And uh, I used to go from Pasadena. I'd go down to Union Station, switch trains, get on the, what is it, the red line, and take it right up to the base of the theater. So yeah, love it. Love it. Uh, Miguel Zan says, Hey Rob, hope all is well. Do you ever think we will get auteur directors dive into our beloved big genre franchises? I would love to see the likes of David Fincher to do a Star Wars film or TV. Why do you think filmmakers like him don't want to do those? Thanks. Well, Miguel, I think you kind of answered the question. Um, Auteur filmmakers, especially writer-directors, although Fincher doesn't write his own stuff, um, you know, they want to tell the stories that they want to tell. And the problem is, it doesn't matter what franchise you're working, uh, working for or with or whatever, the franchise comes first before your work as an auteur director. So as much as I would love to see Fincher do a Star Wars movie, and he did, he was a cameraman at ILM, like when they he shot some of the... Um, the footage for the speeder bike sequence in Return of the Jedi. Uh, I, I don't know if we're ever going to see him. I mean, unless he needed the money and he needed to, you know, Davey got to get paid or something. I, I don't I don't see him ever doing a, a, I don't see him doing a franchise property because he puts too much of himself. I mean, he's such an auteur that he has to have a story that really matters to him. And that's why I don't think you see a lot of our great directors working within franchises because, they don't have to. You know, how many at-bats do you get when you make a movie? It can take sometimes two, three, four years of your life, if not more. And you want to make sure that you're telling a story that matters to you. And when you have the power that an auteur, a successful auteur brings to, to the table, 
you can do hopefully what you want and you don't have to make franchise properties. That doesn't mean that directors of franchise properties aren't great directors. It just means that if you command the power in Hollywood that you can get a movie greenlit, you're not going to go work for somebody who's going to give you a job directing a franchise. If somebody will greenlight a movie you want to make, you will always pick that movie before a big franchise property, unless you need the money or your career's waning or something. You know? Edge of Rezon sends in a tip. It says, hi, John and crew. It looks like the axe of Zaslav strikes again. It looks like WB reportedly won't be releasing Batgirl on streaming or in theaters. What does this mean for the future of the Batgirl movie? Or even bigger, the future of the DCEU? Well, I think we covered it quite extensively today on the John Campia show. You can watch the whole show, or I'm sure Ray has clipped out that whole segment. It's fascinating. Uh, John made a lot of great points it's definitely a deep dive into the situation. But since you asked on here on the mailbag, look, I will say, obviously, I mean, there a decision was made that this movie was not up to snuff for whatever reason. And uh, is it better in the long run to release a movie that they know is not going to do well theatrically or it's not going to be favorable even if it's on streaming? Is 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 it better to shelve a movie like that, even though you're, you spent with reshoots almost $90 million? Is it better to write that off and bury that movie or to let that movie out into the wild and let it do what it's going to do to your brand? And David Zaslav, who is very cognizant of where Warner Brothers is at, where he wants Warner Brothers to go, obviously they spent a lot of money to merge Discovery and Warner Brothers. The last thing they want to do is to start diluting the company's value by releasing product that they're not 100% behind. And clearly, the Scoob movie, despite the protestations of the filmmakers who said, no, no, it's delightful. I can't say one way or another, but clearly the Scoob movie at $40 million and the Batgirl movie at almost $90 million, they felt that $130 million was better to, better to write off than to let those movies go out into the wild. That says something, and as John pointed out, that's leadership. That couldn't have been a... a, a um, an easy decision to make, or maybe it was, maybe the, the movies were so disappointing that it was an easy decision to make. Hard to say. I don't know myself, but I mean, I, I feel for the filmmakers and the stars and all the people that put their heart and souls into those films, but maybe it's better for everybody. No one ever sees them, but I would imagine like in five or 10 years, we might see this Batgirl movie. Maybe they'll finish it because why not? I mean, it is finished content. And once once we're far, far enough along and the new Warner Discovery era is more established, maybe they'll just throw it on to uh, <laughs> HBO Max if it's still called that. Who knows? <clears throat> A Nader Partis says, whenever you are feeling down, what films do you watch? Something to comfort the soul, something from your childhood Please recommend. Thank you. Well, Nader, one of my favorite movies to watch is the long version of Almost Famous. I love Cameron Crowe's Almost Famous. I love everything about it. I kind of identify with the main protagonist. I love everything about that movie. It puts a smile on my face all the time. Uh, I love it. So Almost Famous and the long version, which is on physical media, I always go to Almost Famous with a smile on my face. Other movies I like to watch when I'm down, All About Eve, Best Picture winner of 1950. Yes, it's black and white, but I love the movie so much. It's about the theater and all the people that work in the theater in New York, on Broadway, that kind of thing. I love that movie. I think it's fantastic. Um, another movie I like to put on to, to make myself feel better, To Live and Die in L.A., a movie about a counterfeiter. Uh, and the Secret Service officer going after him. It's got a great Wang Chung score. I know people are going to be like, how can Wang Chung have done a great mu music score? But indeed, they did. They did the instrumental track, and there are songs of theirs like Dance Hall Days that you hear in the film or Wait off their album Points on the Curve, and they did the title track to Live and Die in L.A., directed by the exorcist William Freakin. I don't know why I love to Live and Die in L.A. a lot, but I do. And there's a lot of other movies I would say that I just you know enjoy. Um, Sunset Boulevard's another noir from back in the day that I really love. Um, I love Martin Scorsese's The Aviator. Don't know why. I just love the evocation of the period. And I love, I mean, yeah, Howard Hughes gets wacky in the end, but there's something about that film that the first hour and a half or hour and 45 minutes, I just love that movie. It's so much fun. And speaking of Scorsese, I love his Color of Money. I love 
Goodfellas. These are movies that are on heavy rotation in my house just because I enjoy them. Godfather 1 and 2, always good for a laugh um, or just because they're amazing. And while it's a little trippy Apocalypse Now, a little Francis Ford Coppola triptych there, uh, Godfather 1 and 2 and Apocalypse Now, always good for me. Uh, Rumblefish, another Francis Ford Coppola movie I like to like. I like to watch. Black and White, 1983. Matt Dillon, Mickey Rourke. Angel Heart, there's another movie I really like. Mr. Safier, I love that movie. I don't know why. There's a few. Uh, your mileage may vary. What do you like to watch? Go right down there in the description and tell me because I read every comment. I hang on them. I want to make sure you, you like me. I'm like Sally Field. So tell me what you and what are your favorite movies to, to watch. Uh, Yandrov says, what do you think of Dusty being Nancy and Mike's dad sacrifices himself, somehow goes back in time, too similar to Dark? Okay, I don't even know what this is. Is this a Riverdale thing? Um, do we know? Dusty being Nancy and Mike's dad. Oh, oh, you're talking. I know what you're talking about. You're talking about Stranger Things. I get it now. Um, Dusty, I, I see what you did there. Now I get it. Uh, I don't think it's too similar to dark. It's, it, I mean, when you're dealing with time travel, that could happen. I don't know if they're going to go that far. I mean, look, the upside down is one thing. And, and now we learned in season four that the upside down is actually stuck in one moment of time, which I thought was fascinating. Um, I don't think it'd be too similar to dark. I, not at all. Uh, I don't know if they're going to do that, but interesting. I like the idea. I like where you're going with that. I don't know if they're going to do it, but I like where you're going with that. Took me. It took me a minute. I'm like, Dusty? Ah, Stranger Things. Uh, good question. We'll see what happens. They started writing yesterday. Bailey96 says, hi, crew. First time writing in. Love the show. Thoughts on the TV series Sliders starring Jerry O'Connell and John Rhys-Davies. I love the show overall, but was left so frustrated by the series finale cliffhanger 22 years later, and I still need closure. You know, I liked Sliders, but it got really interesting, I thought, when they brought the Cro-Mags on. A lot of people didn't like the whole Cro-Mag thing, but I kind of liked it because they needed, I mean, the first season with John Rhys-Davies was fun, but it was kind of unfocused, and uh, I, I watched it. But I got much more interested when the Cro-Mags had come on and that whole that whole storyline. But yeah, I mean, I like Sliders a lot. I don't know if they would ever do a new movie or do... I could see them rebooting it, though. I don't know if we'll ever find out what happened to our, our, our main crew, but I could see them rebooting the show. Um, it would be funny to bring the original cast back, though. John Rhys-Davies is still around. I don't know if he'd do it, but it'd be interesting. Sam Fisher. One of three says, so I'm two episodes into Light and Magic, the docuseries about ILM, and I am loving it. I love that these guys are the ragtag gang of outsiders, the land of misfit toys. I love that it's, I know a guy who knows a guy who knows a guy. <laughs> and I love that they were the jack of all trade guys. The matte painter could model make, the model maker could run the camera, the camera guy could do the lighting and grips. Uh, Grip and Electric, and Dykstra could do it all. Why are these guys always the innovators? And their home movies are fantastic. They remind me of all the YouTube videos my buddies would make when we were in middle school. Well, Sam, first of all, I loved Light and Magic, and a lot of that footage that they took of each other, never seen before. That stuff is gold. But, you know, I think that a lot of these guys, and I would say the same was sort of true for me, when you start playing around with movies – you kind of are doing it by yourself. So you learn uh, how to do all these different things. You learn how to use cameras. You Now you can learn how to use computers. And when I was a kid, there was a magazine that everybody bought called Starlog Magazine. And it, come out, it came out every month. But they had a sister publication called Cinemagic. And it was directed towards all of us budding filmmakers. And it would show you how to do stop motion and how to light things and make spaceships. And so... Like I had, I had a Minolta XL 601 with an intervalometer so I could do single frame work, no sound, but, um, I was using it to make super eight, super eight movies when I was a kid. And, you know, you had to do everything you had. To, I made a lot of movies with my star Wars figures and you had to build models. Or you had to build sets and then you had to learn how to blow stuff up. So what looked better on camera, you couldn't just put gasoline on something and have it burn. You know, you had to figure out like magnesium, what would that look like? And so you actually learned how to do everything. And I think a lot of the people, if you look at the people, um, 
in that documentary, they were all very handy. You know, before there were computers, but everybody sort of could build things and film things because they had to paint things, people who were artistically inclined. And, you know, most of the people that I know in the film business kind of were the same way. Everybody came to L.A. from elsewhere. I know very few people that grew up here, but everybody everybody uh, came from another place to work in the film business. And a lot of the people that I know, we've been in you know various parts of the film business for like 30 years now. We're all those kinds of jack of all trades people. And you came down and you kind of had to carve your own way, uh, carve your own niche. And it was the same thing. I know a guy who knows a guy who knows a guy. And that philosophy, at one point they say, if you hire a great person, they'll bring other great people with them. That's pretty true. And when you first start working in movies, that's kind of how it kind of works out, especially if you're working on indie movies. So like, oh, well, I know a guy who knows a guy and we'll get him to come in and do this thing. And that's kind of how the business works. So I really like seeing that in that documentary. I thought it was great. I love that documentary. It was so good. You know what else is so good? Our friends at Peacock and their new show, The Resort. We want to take a second to thank the sponsor of this video, Peacock's new series, The Resort. In Peacock's must-see new series, there's more than just trouble in paradise. There's a flip phone, a disappearance, and a suspiciously timed hurricane. The Resort, a new Peacock original from the creators of Palm Springs and Mr. Robot, is an unexpected exploration of how love, marriage, and family can be a real trip. When a couple finds an old flip phone in the jungle on an anniversary getaway, they are unknowingly pulled into an unsolved mystery, a bizarre case that went cold 15 years prior when a once in a century storm wiped away all the evidence. This journey through the Mayan Riviera will take you from the edge of your seat to the depths of human experience and back again. Starring William Jackson Harper, Kristen Milioti, Luis Gerardo Mendez, and Nick Offerman, the resort is streaming now only on Peacock. And thanks to the folks at Peacock. And I, you know, I, I've heard the show's good. I got to check it out. The resort. Uh, Sam Fisher with another question. Question. With Disney being ILM's parent company, does ILM now only work on Disney movies? Are they allowed to do that, or is that illegal, falling under some sort of monopoly law? Well, no, it's like any other company. If a company can work whoever they want to work for, I mean, I guess if Disney says, no, you must only now work on Disney movies, they could probably say that. But, you know, ILM is a is a standalone company that hopefully is profitable. So and I know they 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 were taking in a lot of money for a while. So I'm sure that's a great revenue stream for Disney. But I would imagine that ILM would probably give Disney movies a priority. But if you think about it, I mean, that's a lot. Um, look at how many effects people are working on one one Marvel movie. And even now, even ILM, I don't think as big as it is, is big enough to do all the effects. N normally, ILM it doesn't work this way anymore, but it used to be like ILM would do all of the effects on a movie. And if you watch the ILM documentary, as you did, you'll know that, like, I think they said Jurassic Park only had like 44 shots in it, 44 effect shots. That's not a lot when you think about it. And then, of course, now films have thousands of effect shots. So one house like ILM cannot do everything. So they, they farm out effects to all over the world. Look at the uh, next time you watch a Marvel movie, take a gander at how many people are in those end credits. A lot. Uh, Anonymous says, Killmonger officially replaced T'Challa in Black Panther Act 2. In Act 3, we learned that was a bad idea. When T'Challa offered to save his life, he chose dying over changing. He came out uh, came out in 2018, and everyone is asking for Killmonger's Black Panther. Can watch it on Disney Plus. Anonymous, that is a great point to make. Killmonger already was Black Panther, and we saw it in the original film. Uh, it didn't work out that well. <laughs> so you're absolutely right. I think sometimes it's always good to be reminded of these things. So yes, Killmonger was already Black Panther, and he his he was usurped. His time at the throne was short. Uh, and his time as Black Panther was even shorter, but that's a good point to make. You can watch the movie on Disney+. Plus. I like what you did there. Uh, Orange Hand says, One of George R. R. Martin's influences for his books was a fantasy trilogy, Memory, Sorrow, and Thorn, that one would think would have been adapted to screen by now. Are there any properties out there that you're surprised haven't been adapted yet well orange hand i'm always uh, i always go back to dan simmons hyperion cantos uh they've been talking about making the hyperion books forever 
Martin Scorsese was uh, attached to them at one point. Those are four books. There's Hyperion and Fall of Hyperion, and then there's Endymion and Rise of Endymion. I think that uh, Hyperion, Fall of Hyperion, would written as one book, but then the publisher made Dan Simmons cut it in half, and it was released as two books. I think uh, Hyperion would actually make a great television series. Uh, it'd be hard to do, but and it would need a real visionary, but I think it could be great. That's just one of the series that I've I've really wanted to see adapted to film. Dan Simmons, Hyperion. Uh, it's science fiction, not fantasy, but check it out. It's really, really, really good. You'll enjoy it. Fizzy Barf. Now, I don't know why. I don't I don't ever want to see Fizzy Barf. Uh, I, 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 there must be a story. I need to know what it is. Did you eat a lot of Pop Rocks and then ex that throw up? Like, where'd you go? How, how does Fizzy Barf work? I, I, I don't, you know what? I don't want to know. But I, I like the name. Fizzy Barf. There may be evidence to disprove this, but is it possible that the reason the events of the Eternals haven't been addressed is because it hasn't actually happened yet, and the Eternals is actually the latest event in the MCU chronologically? That could be. I mean, you know, Disney Plus, and I have not checked this out, but apparently Disney Plus actually has a chronology of the MCU. And I, I probably should go consult that and find out when Eternals takes place. But it must be one of the latter, you know, the later movies. And it must be, right? I mean, I would think it is. That would make sense to me. So I don't know. But I think that's a good hypothesis. That could very well be why no one is addressing these issues in the movie. I just think, look, we talk about this a lot. I just think it's obtrusive when you not only have Arshem the Celestial talking to the people of the Earth and he's like three times the size of the planet. And the Earth has, what, a 7,000-mile-long diameter, which means Arashem is probably 21,000 miles tall. I mean, that's a big dude. And no one's saying anything about him. What about the celestial crawling out of the Earth? I mean, I would think these are gigantic events, maybe not as big as having humanity snapped away or whatever, but I would think that it would put, uh, put a lot of us into a tailspin if we saw... A character, well, one coming out of the ocean or one in space. Uh, I mean, I, you know, but you could be right. I don't know. I don't know. I, I, I need to go now. Now it's one of those things that's on my to-do list. I need to find out where, in fact, does the Eternals sit within the MCU timeline? See, now, that's why I love you guys. Now I'm pondering the mystery, like Shatner. Uh, we'll see what happens. Uh, Robert, Wa oh, Robert Wagner Boat tours you should be ashamed of yourself i was a big natalie wood fan why do you got to bring that stuff up of course her last movie douglas trumbull's brainstorm came out in 1983 if you haven't seen it christopher walken's in it with of course natalie wood robert wagner boat tours uh in my opinion some of the greatest sound design in all of cinema is the diarrhea scene in dumb and dumber i'm not kidding it is so realistic. There are so many different sounds and attentions to detail that make it hilarious and tragically realistic. Well, Robert Wagner's Boat Tours, you know, I've never really paid that much attention to diarrhea sound design, but hey, um, you're right. I mean, obviously, I've, I've, I've had enough diarrhea in my own life to know that it always sounds different. And if you're going to be a great sound designer, it can't just be one sound. It's, it's a whole sort of... Um, an ecosystem of sounds, as it were. Um, and I, you know what? I never thought I would ever utter these words, but now I want to go back and watch Dumb and Dumber just so I can hear what the diarrhea sounds like. You people, I love you all, really. Uh, Nathan, one of two, says, Hey, Rob, since you asked, I wanted to send a follow to my message from last week after, after watching 100 movies. Yes, it was the 1957 version of 12 Angry Men. A few of the horror movies I watched were Alien, Train to Busan, Robert Eggers' The Witch, all of which was a buildup to me watching The Shining. Uh, also, I just want to clarify regarding movies from MCU directors. I watched a film from each of the 19 directors of the MCU. So 19 of the 100 films were from MCU directors, which means so you didn't watch 19 MCU films. You watched 19 movies, other movies that were from directors of MCU movies. That's good. I like that, Nathan. Um, good list. Now, here's the thing. You know, you built up to see The Shining. I guess The Shining in your mind was the end-all, be-all of horror. 
I'd be curious, what did you learn from from all that, and how did you feel about The Shining? Did you dig it? Uh, write in and, and uh, tell me. I want to know. I want to know what you thought of The Shining. And by the way, why were you building up to The Shining? Had it heard? Had you heard about what it was like? And is that why you put it on such a, a pedestal? I'd love to know. Write me because, of course, it was directed by Stanley Kubrick. It was the it was the third to last movie he made. He made it after Barry Lyndon, and he made it before I uh, um, Full Metal Jacket. So he didn't make enough movies in my mind, but hey, The Shining is a pretty good one. Interestingly enough, Stephen King did not like his adaptation of The Shining. And one of the reasons, one of the things he cited for not liking The Shining is he Stephen King thought that you know Jack Nicholson's batshit crazy at the beginning of the movie. And it's not a it's not a surprise. And and in the book, it's a slow descent into madness, but Jack Nicholson was already crazy, and you knew that from the beginning. So that's one of the reasons Stephen King criticized the finished film. But what did you think? I'd love to know. Write in and tell me. Tell me, maybe. Uh, Ethan Holgate writes in, one of two. Hi, Rob. I have to say I'm really disappointed to hear that the WB is even considering on canceling the Batgirl movie. I was really excited to see it because I love the guys directing it. Honestly, don't understand why couldn't they just release it anyway um let's see what the second part of that is yeah they're looking to reshape dc and all that but they'll only be throwing money down the drain by shelving it why not change a few things in it if they're unhappy with it or put it on hbo max i don't know to be honest i just wish they weren't canceling it you know i look i really want to see it too but on the other hand this this was not a decision made willy-nilly somebody didn't just go hey you know what back not that good let's cancel it that's not how, how how it goes. I mean, the movie was still in production. There were still millions of dollars more to spend. And I think they just looked at it. And you don't you don't get this a lot from studio executives, but David Zaslav can swing his axe because he has the power. He's kind of like being in Grayskull. He has the power, but he has a sword. I mean, an axe instead of a sword. And he did it. And I think that, you know, would the Batgirl movie be better if it was released or did it actually damage the DC brand? And I think that's... Look, making a good superhero movie is a hard thing to do. It's hard to strike that balance. So I can see that, hey, they looked at it and they looked at the Scooby movie and they said, you know what? These just aren't good enough. Because if they were good enough, I think there would be no hesitation to release them. But it doesn't look like they were. Look, I, I'm like you. I, I want to see this Batgirl movie. And you know what? Who are we kidding? Uh, every one of us is going to want to see that Batgirl movie. We're going to figure out a way. Somehow, some it's either going to wind up at a convention somewhere or friends of ours who live in L.A. will say, hey, man, come over to my house and we'll, let's watch Batgirl and make fun of it. But I do want to see it too. But unfortunately, the powers that be said, nope, we're not releasing this POS. We're not going to spend more money on it. It's a bummer, but I have to respect their wishes. James L.H. says, can I just mention a recent set in film by Jenny Agutter, known for John's favorite horror, Logan's Run, also Avengers and Winter Soldier. Have you seen the 1970s British classic, The Railway Children, 66 in the BFI 100? She set a record of 52 years when returning to play the same role in the recent UK release of the sequel, The Railway Children Return. James L.H., I did not know that. First of all, I love Jenny Agutter, and when I was nine years old and saw Logan's run in the theater, when she dropped Trow in the ice cave, oh, man, that was the first time I saw naked boobies in a theater. I mean, and I loved it. I wanted to, like, get underneath that bear skin with her, man. And if you if you are a big fan of I didn't know that about Jenny Agutter coming back, but if you also want to see peak Jenny Agutter in the Australian outback, she's even younger than she was in Logan's run. I mean, Logan's run, she's like in her early twenties, but watch Nicholas Rogue's movie walkabout great movie where her and her brother are trapped in the Australian outback or they're lost out there. They have to survive. It's great. Also Jenny Agutter, you know what I'm saying? But that's really interesting. I don't know anything about the railway children and I didn't know she came back. Now I want to know, is that like, the longest period of time any actress took to come back to play the same role in a sequel was that 56 years or something but uh she still looks good she was also in um the tv series in the uk it's called spooks here it's called mi5 uh she was in that uh show too i'm a big fan i love her voice and she was the hot nurse in an american werewolf in london yeah she was and she's she's got a great shower scene so if you're one of those lascivious guys, and I know you are, like I am, you'll remember her. 
Indeed. Uh, James LH goes on to say, uh, uh, one of two. Hi, John. This week sees the UK release of Bullet Train. Next week is nope. But last night, Tuesday, I went to the 35th anniversary release of RoboCop. On the 20th of August is the director's cut of Star Trek The Motion Picture. Perfect timing just before my birthday. I've been jealous of hearing Rob talk about it. Then the 3rd of September for the 40th anniversary of Wrath of Khan. I was desperate for the UK cinema release of my two favorite Trek films with my favorite Trek cast as I first saw them on cinemas back when they were first released in 79 and 82 respectively. Well, James L.H., damn, that sounds fun. Uh, I think you're going to really like the director's cut of the motion picture. By the way, it's coming out in the UK as a four-disc set. And you might ask yourself, hey, Rob, did you order the 4K or the four-disc UK 4K set uh, from the – did you order the 4K four-disc UK Star Trek The Motion Picture Director's Edition set? on physical media and the answer to that question is yes yes i did and i'm having it sent from amazon uk comes out next month very very excited but i'm more excited for you to get to go to the theater and see star trek the motion picture the director's cut what you'll particularly notice more than i think than anything else is the sound mix the sound mix is absolutely spectacular it sounds better and different than you've ever heard it before fantastic and of course and i think the version of star trek 2 that showing is actually the director's cut, so there's a couple more scenes that weren't in the original theatrical version. See if you can spot them. But uh, it sounds great, so have a good time. And, of course, live long and prosper. A man, a man nicknamed Pooh Bear says, Rest in peace, Vin Scully. Watch one of my favorite baseball movies last night in his honor, For Love of the Game, with Kevin Costner and the late Kelly Preston. What are some of your baseball movies? Well, my first was The Bad News Bears. When I was a kid, I loved The Bad News Bears. Uh, of course, Pride of the Yankees, The Natural, Bull Durham, Field of Dreams. Uh, those are some of my favorite baseball movies. I think Bull Durham might be my... I mean, Field of Dreams take, takes place around baseball, but it's not really a baseball movie per se. But I do think Bull Durham might be my favorite baseball movie of all time, I think. Justin Rasmussen says, with Black Panther hitting theaters in November, a lot of speculation on who is the next Black Panther. Most likely, Shuri, what are your thoughts on the White Wolf, a.k.a. Bucky Barnes, being the next Black Panther <clears throat> with his ties to Wakanda, bring on the filthy? You know, I never really thought about that, but for me, <laughs> I would imagine that Black Panther, one of the prerequisites is he has to come or she has to come from Wakanda. I, I don't think an outsider could take on the mantle of Black Panther. I mean, maybe. I'm not up with my Marvel Comics lore, so I don't know if anyone outside of Wakanda has become Black Panther. I mean, that could be an interesting choice, but I think for because of what Wakanda represents, you would need somebody actually from Wakanda to be Black Panther. I don't think they would allow outsiders to do that. I mean, they just open up their borders, so I hardly think that they're going to allow a outsider to be black panther but i don't know i i don't know the white wolf being black panther the winter soldier i don't know i mean obviously they they healed him they healed his mind and body but i don't know if they'd allow that it'd be interesting though i never thought about that hmm we'll know soon enough stav sends in a tip and says how much do you think batgirl's cancellation had to do with damage to the brand of the batman it could damage the Batman 2 box office if a bad Batgirl movie comes out before it. What do you think Zaz has planned for Reeves and how are they canceling HBO Max scripted shows? Does this spell damage for the Penguin Arkham Gotham City PD show? Thanks for the great show, everyone. Well, Stav, I think obviously the the HBO, the earnings call, the, the Warner Brothers Discovery earnings calls tomorrow, we'll know more about that. But... You know, I don't think that that Discovery is going to get rid of HBO, first of all. I don't think they've got too many great programs, too many people watch that stuff. However, I could see them retiring the HBO name because it doesn't directly relate to Warner Brothers or Warner Brothers Discovery. I could see that happening. They rebrand um, HBO to Warner Discovery or something else, and 
rejigger how the the how it works, bring in discovery into the fold. It's one big screen streaming service. I don't know. Um, but as far as I don't think they canceled the Batman. I mean, I don't think they canceled Batgirl because of the Batman. I think that overall Batgirl was just not up to and it's not just up to snuff in terms of DC movies, but I think people have come to expect a level of whether it's Sony making their Spider-Man movies. I mean, look what happened to Morbius. It's it's more been time for some people, but not enough people at the box office. That movie turned out to be a real disappointment. And I think looking at something like Morbius and how it actually could have damaged the entire Spider-Man brand, that's probably something they looked at and they realized this movie's not that great. And Matt Reeves did a great job, knocked it out of the park with the Batman. They're probably saying to themselves, uh, we don't need our brand sullied in this way. Not like Vince Gully, but sullied, you know what I mean? So I think that that's probably what they decided to do. So, and that, my friends, is the end of today's mailbag for Wednesday, August 3rd, 2022. My name is, of course, Robert Meyer Burnett. You can find me at RM Burnett on Instagram, Burnett RM on Twitter, or find me on my own YouTube channel or my website, postgeeksingularity.com, or just postgeeksingularity. And I want to thank all of you out there for sending in great things to talk about. We really appreciate the support from all of us here at the John Campia Show. And remember, you too, right down at that link, you can send us questions, reviews, send me, I don't know, send me embarrassing stories of yourself. I don't know. Whatever you want to send me. And if we deem them appropriate, we will read them right here on the mailbag. I want to thank John Campier for letting me do this. And I want to thank Jonathan Voico sitting right over there for producing the show and our sponsor for today, The Peacock Show, The Resort. I'm Robert Meyer Burnett, and I will see you in the next mailbag. <laughs>